And best of luck. Thank you. Uh, hello, guys. Uh, my name is Alexandra, as you can notice. And uh, today I want to speak with you about uh, the ethical side of information leak research. So, who am I? I'm working in the field of implementing and uh, improving the IT service management processes. I am mostly writing documents. Uh, and I have experience uh, in information security. But uh, on the other side, I have a psychological education and I am a consulting psychologist and working with people. And why I decided to make this talk? The idea uh, was born after the situation with Ashley Madison dating site. All of you know about this site. Uh, this uh, breach wasn't the biggest one um, and maybe not so interesting, uh, but a lot of people was affected by it. Not only the persons who are, was really registered on this site, but their families and the uh, people who don't even register because registration don't, don't need uh, approving by email. So anyone can just uh, some, get some information from you and took on this site and you're Ashley Madison member. Uh, And as you know, a lot of scandals, divorces, and all such stuff uh, was around this breach. Uh, and even as a pair say already, uh, some people was so affected by this situation what they decide to commit suicide after it. Uh, and uh, I'm a, as a psychologist, I know what the base need of most people is uh, being safe. You, all of us really want to be in safe, and if we lose this safety, we can do a lot of things like this, even like this. And that's why I want to speak about the privacy, the ethics, and such things with you as a people who uh, use these breaches and information from these breaches as uh, research uh, materials. So. Uh, one of the consequences of the information revolution can be considered the possibility of losing uh, of our individual privacy right. Uh, and without this right, uh, our existence become controlled and our dignity as human individuals may be impaired. After all, the ability to control the information about themselves is uh, the moral basis of the right of privacy. And uh, here we have a very important then <laughs> diagram about privacy on the internet. Uh, uh, today, uh, a lot of information stored in data, data banks and in the internet. Uh, so uh, you can mm, get some data to some sites uh, for one purpose, and anybody can use it for other purposes. They're just without uh, any notification to you. So. There is no privacy on the internet, but uh, you know this, I know this, but a lot of people think what we can go to the internet, get some, some information on the site like Ashley Medicine, for example, and it will be safe in good hands. They don't know anything about this. Uh, so, uh, but after some evil persons get this information from Ashley Medicine, etc., you can go to the internet and download it and use it as a material for your researches and make some interesting uh, conclusions uh, what help you to improve some information security, etc. But at the end of the things, it's just information about the human lives. So, let's say some words about the background of this situation. Then I begin uh, my relationship with the internet. Uh, it was, uh, access speed was only 56 kilobits per second. Maybe no, 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 not everybody of you remember these times. And uh, I pay uh, 20 bucks for the month of the internet. And it was only 50 hours for of the internet. And now I pay 10 bucks and I have uh, the access speed uh, 500 megabits, gig, megabits per second. So I can download and upload a lot of information. Uh, and uh, now we have a lot of things like torrents and dark web, and we ha have a lot of space where we can store and share a lot of information. So, let's see this graph 
it's information about leaks for the past 10 years uh, from uh, 2004 till 2010. And you can see uh, every bubble on the screen is a leak. Uh, and the size of leak is its sensitivity. Not a lot of leaks here and not big leaks, as you can see. So we can see the next slide. And, it's, and uh, it shows us what the last five years, and we have a lot of breaches, a lot of leaks, and uh, a lot of really sensitive information. Uh, not only the number of leaks increased, but the sensitivity of data. Let's see. So in 2004, a wall breach, a lot of uh, accounts were stolen, but only email addresses, logins, and passwords. And we can see what in our recent times, it's records with personal details about the sexuality, about your preferences, genders, home addresses, names, and a lot of stuff. Uh, but we don't uh, only need to uh, get this information, but we really need to share it. And if 10 years ago you need to get these things, then write something on the compact disk or maybe hard drives, and they'd be happy if it's not a floppy disk if you remember what is it. Uh, now we have uh, torrents. And as you can see, uh, gigabytes of information, you can just go and download it. And uh, if previously you need to uh, get these disks and meet some guys who you just get, give this disk to them, or maybe hard drives, now you just go to the internet and everything you can find there. So, what's in the end? You could get information, mostly about the usernames and passwords, 10 years ago. And now you can get everything, including addresses, uh, even the private messages from the site. Everything. And if earlier you can transfer it to the set on CDs and hard drives, now just press the button and everything will be uploaded by torrents. But in the end, we have a law. And what about the law of these situations? We have Article 8 of the European Covenant of Human Rights that protects the right uh, to respect the private life. Everyone has the right to respect for his private and family life, his home, and his correspondence. And we have Article of the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights of the United Nations, what also protects privacy. And we have a lot of countries that have their own data protection directives and laws uh, that must uh, protect uh, the private life of citizens. A lot of countries, more than uh, 18. But it's a bright side of this situation. We have a dark side too. Uh, everything, now what, what does it mean? Uh, so, uh, uh, sometimes our governments not only protect us, but uh, collect information about the pri private life of the citizens. Uh, um, all this, they have good enough reason, your own safety reason, uh, to get this information, collect it, analyze it, and do a lot of stuff with it. So, uh, NSA in, became a mem already. But uh, all of this is not only funny, but also underlines a big threat on privacy. So you can tell me I'm Russian, and that's why I am talking about the NSA, because we are Americans. So I have a slide, especially for this. <laughs> you, uh, I can say the same thing as about the NSA, about any, a lot of agencies around the world. They are all, I think, I don't have any uh, real uh, no news about it, but I, I hope they are all collecting stuff about the citizens all around the world, about their own citizens, and about the people from around, from around the world too. So, and we have uh, some interesting question. For example, this one. Uh, what happened if the leak occurred in one country, dumped and loaded by a citizen of another country, 
and when he uploads the information on servers located in a third country. What law we need to use in such a situation? For example, if it's Europe, America, and China. We don't know. And a lot of interesting questions I have. Uh, so, for me, the last stronghold of ethics in the handling of information about the private life was the academic research. Uh, and I'm really, uh, when I start thinking about this talk, I, I'm tr I was uh, trying to say what the universities, they are really know how to pr protect and respect uh, the uh, private life of citizens and they know how to handle the care. But uh, the latest story of the Tor network has put this idea into question. Do you know what the Tor network is? I think yes. So, the story was what in January uh, 2014, Torn Network uh, have uh, some new relays joined the Torn Network. And in the June, two researchers assert it's a part of Software Institute in Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, we have this uh, talk for Black Hat Conference. Uh, you don't have to be NSA to break Tor. The anonymizing user on the budget. And we are talking about the how they can uh, the anonymize store users just for 300, 3,000 bucks. And uh, after this presentation was canceled at all. And uh, uh, after all these things, in July, the Tor project ejects uh, all these attacking relays. Uh, but uh, they think what third researchers attacking them. And in the end of the story, the information from the Tor, Tor network led to the identification of criminal suspects. Uh, they are on the dark web, both suspects who include a staff member of drug marketplace and the man ch charged with possession of child pornography. And we can think, yes, nice. Uh, we can rejoice the triumph of uh, justice uh, if it wasn't one small detail. We don't know how many people was under surveillance all this time. It's more than half a year. And I really think not all of them are criminals. But FBI collecting information about them using this stuff. We don't know really what uh, university helped the FBI because the uh, Carnegie Mellon don't deny or accept any uh, speculation surrounding the situation. They don't say yes, they don't say no, but in the end it, it's not at all important which one university helping FBI. The more important thing, what uh, the academic researchers can do such things. They can use their knowledge to disrespect the private life of people. So, and I think it's uh, really, it's time to talk about the ethics. What we have in the end? Threats all around us. Uh, law is not so helpful. Uh, universities, not always on the side of privacy protection. And information from leaks can be really helpful for you. You can use it and research something. So, we really need to speak about the ethics. What is ethics? Uh, it's, a bright, it's a branch of philosophy. It investigates the question sites, what's good and what's bad. Uh, information security researchers often don't have any restrictions on the use of data what they have obtained. And even if this data is not used to the name of evil, in the end of this thing, you use the information what nobody accept to use. You always have information what nobody come and tell you, yes, you can do it, just use it, it's okay. We not ask about it, we can, it, we have 40 millions uh, of uh, uh, accounts on Ashley Medicine, how many people we ask, do, do, can we use your information for our researchers? No one. <coughs> And the, this is this is ethical kitten in the white hat, uh, and he asks you 
this question, is it ethical at all to use the information obtained as a result of leaks for research? Uh, I know what everybody of you have the notorious head and there's some color, maybe white, maybe black, maybe gray. Uh, but for me, it's really important every time when you use the information from leaks, uh, what the color of your head now? Is it maybe a little more gray than it was? I don't know. For me, it's not ethical to use this kind of information. It's my opinion and I really uh, want to hear your opinions. So, all this time you can see it and think, what, how all this connected to you? You just have some hashes and everything you do is cracking them and, the, and that's all. But uh, it's some details what we need to think about. For example, one of them is password themselves can be the private and sensible information. For example, if I am working in the international company, my name is Alexandra Stigunkova, and uh, my surname isn't widespread even in Russia. And around the world, it's really rare. And what if I have uh, a password? You know, somebody, some expert like you come to my company and just get some audit, get some hashes and crack them just to realize how many employees have a weak password. And among them was my one. And it was something like uh, Alexandra Strugunkova uh, have AIDS, for example. And that's why you have um, private, really sensitive information about me. Not even know my uh, account, na account name or username or something. You just crack my password and it was like this. Uh, and uh, one more interesting question is people reuse their password. So then you have a leak and you get some hashes and you crack them and you know the passwords and you know the person which pa password is belong to. So you know we have so many places where we can lose our privacy on the internet uh, if we use our password. So you crack some leaks but not only this site is under, is in danger now, but a lot of sites where this person can be, uh, can have accounts because you know his username and password. So, for me, the data obtained as a result of information leak can, can inflict the real harm to human life as we can see after the Ashley medicine and the suicides of that people. And I think it, it's time Time has come to pay more attention, not only to ethical hacking and responsible disclosure, but the ethical treatment of information obtained as a result of breaches and leaks. Yes, these leaks are really can be scientific, uh, can uh, be used for scientific purposes and they can really help to improve some information security and you can use it for some really interesting researches, but it, it's always worth remembering what the letters and numbers, it's not only the letters and numbers at all, it can be the part of somebody's life, a real people life. But it, 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 it's not just digits, it's something what really important for them. And uh, the price of, your, of this progress, the price of your uh, researchers can be very high for these people. And that's all. I want to speak to you. A friend of mine doing penetration testing in Norway actually talked to the government agency that are looking after our privacy. And he asked them, he said, I want to do regular password audits for a large hospital. And the only thing I want to do, he said, is to extract the password hashes, not the usernames, not the full name, nothing else, just the hashes and crack them. Do you have an opinion on that? And the response was that, well, the password by itself is not a sensitive piece of confidential information, but people consider it to be. And, as Alexandra pointed out, before you crack the password, you don't know its contents. So it could actually say, Per has AIDS. And suddenly, 
you are in possession of a piece of information that is highly sensitive to me and anyone else. Now, I want to crack passwords, <laughs> but there's absolutely a dilemma here that I think is very interesting to discuss, like Alexander has been talking about now. So that is kind of like, you know, one of the many topics that I challenge you to talk about for the evening. But first, questions for Alexander, or should I say comments, maybe? Jeff? Yeah? Jeff is always first. <laughs> we'll do Frank first, yes, actually. Please. Yeah, Frank. I'm curious as to this example that you both used. I mean, we, we have said many times that this couple of days people choose really dumb passwords. Why would anyone want to choose I have AIDS as their password? In Ashley Madison, people were using passphrases like, oh my god, I shouldn't be doing this. What the hell am I doing here? Yeah, so, yeah, and I, I, you know, I, want, I can't disk all the passwords I have ever seen because there are millions of them. But you just can't look away from the fact people could do something like that. Uh, I mean, they could reveal themselves. I personally know from my own experience, from my own statistics, that in a corporate environment, 1% to 2% approximately will be using the first name, the last name, or both as part of their password. So suddenly, you know, already there, I have, even if I just have the passwords on the password hashes, one to two percent of them will be identifiable just because they have put in their name in the password. Yeah, uh, I'm just trying to understand uh, the motivation, if you have any insight, I'd be interested to know. And, uh, oh, you know, uh, it's, not, it, it, it's not only be a name and surname, it can be something like this, uh, my uh, lover's name is, I don't know, John. And if you know, we are talking about leaks, not about you know hashes and uh, all this stuff. And it, well, my password will be my lover's name is uh, John, for example. Yeah. And you know what I have a lover, for example. It's about my private life. Yeah. I, I, I have found passwords that consisted of you know the secret phone number of somebody. And since you know, I have a secret phone number, so I'll use that as my password as well. That exists. Yeah. Well, just adding to that, if you're doing a research on uh, school children at age, they'll often put their crushes in the password. Um, it'll be, often be their name for and then their boyfriend, girlfriend, or wanting to be. So if that gets exposed, the social pressures uh, involved, especially with small schools which don't protect the passwords properly or at all, yeah. um, you can get that information out and it causes big problems. People that were being exposed by Ashley Madison, there were gay men in Saudi Arabia yeah. that had accounts from Ashley Madison. And that, obviously, that was one of my examples. I, I, I really was a little shy to use it. For example, if I work in the international corporation and my password, for example, gay is good, and for LGBT, it's, and if you are in the uh, United States of America and you are, have such password, gay is good, it's okay. But uh, if you're working in Saudi Arabia? On top. Uh, sorry, just a comment. So, uh, when, you, when you talk about it, it's two, maybe two book uh, topics for, to discuss. Because uh, from Saudi Arabia uh, point of view, it's not eight it's, it's not good to, to think that eight Maybe I can answer you. No, no, it's, it's, uh, 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 more. I think we, can, we could not, we cannot uh, uh, reason about this in, in common. But when, when you have particular password that <coughs> actually might uh, 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 lead to some uh, change in, in your life, you, you need to think. It, it was the it, it was the idea of my talk. Every but time you need to think you about it. Elizabeth. Or advice um, these review boards have provided. I don't know if anyone here has experience with 
Anyone from the academic community that would like to give an answer to that? No, it's really. The things that come up in the data I collect are that I don't ask for passwords. Um, I have to give participants the right of refusal and informed consent. I have to be very careful about anonymization. And so I imagine those are all things that could be applied to these kinds of data sets. Hmm. I think the other thing that comes up in the context of the institutional review board is the idea of sort of um, worthwhileness. Totally, some research that's going on with these data sets warrants their use, but I imagine a lot of it doesn't. And I don't know how to distinguish those. And I'm not sure what kind of criteria to put on them, but that's probably something worth thinking about. I, I like can, yeah. I, I, can, I can also tell you, I can go all the way back to the first uh, time we did password scan in 2010. Uh, the very first speaker was Howard Smith from Oracle in the UK. And he was basically talking about how people select their pin codes and how predictable or not predictable they are. But at the end of day one, he said, uh, well, I would, re and this was in December 2010, he said, I would really like to discuss the ethics of cracking passwords. And I asked the audience, well, should we go for dinner or should we do a uh, discussion on ethics? So we discussed ethics for like an hour on that topic. And basically, we did end up, uh, end up by telling Howard that, well, you know, cracking passwords is, well, I'm not going to say more important than that ethics, but we agreed, most of us, that, you know, there are so much more we can do to improve security by cracking passwords and doing research into anything related to passwords that, you know, in a way, we see that as more important than the ethics part. But still, of course, we need to be very careful about the ethics of these things. And I would assume that also in the academic world, this could also be of very interest. You're not collecting the passwords? Well, we have presentations there about, you know, the password security questions, and eventually the replies to those questions. That can be just as revealing as the password itself. Yeah, yeah. so talk to Marcus. <laughs> and Maximilian, you yeah. know. Yeah. Did you talk to the ethics committee about doing that part of research? Yeah, the ethics, ethics committee, we tried to find one, and that was us, we didn't find one. Okay, and that, that's, that's Germany for you, guys. Right? Um, so, okay, well, again, thank you, Alexandra.